Hey guys, Mr. Mice is here, and we are on number three, 1C continuity. <laughs> A lot of rhyming there for you. We're looking at BC Calculus Lesson 1C, and we're talking about continuity today. So what are, what are we talking about when we're saying a function is continuous? So, you know, if you were drawing a function, kind of an informal way to think about this is if you were drawing a graph, if you have to lift up your pencil and then draw the rest of the graph, then there is a dis a then the function is not continuous at wherever you had to pick up your pencil right it's like a break in the graph right you, you can't finish it so um formally though in calculus a continuous function a function that is continuous is continuous at a point where that limit is equal to the function so if the limit and the function itself are equal then the the function is called continuous at that point we will if a function is not continuous then it's called a discontinuity we have two real important discontinuities that we deal with in bc calculus the first one's called a non-removable discontinuity now it means it cannot be removed from the graph we those happen at either vertical asymptotes or jumps like breaks in the graph a removable discontinuity is one that we can remove by just shading in a hole in the graph so if there's a hole in the graph that we can shade in then it's removable as long as the function remains a function once we shade that in so um, let's take a look real quick where are some discontinuities in my graph here that I have uh, on my screen well we notice we got to pick up our pencil right here so we have a discontinuity at x equals negative 1 we have a dis another discontinuity at x equals 2 a discontinuity at x equals negative 3 and one at x equals 5 well what type of discontinuities are these the first one is a not is a non-removable discontinuity. The reason this is non-removable is because if I shade it in, even though this is a hole, if I shade it in the hole, I would end up with two points, which would be uh, not a function. That's different than number that than the discontinuity at x equals two. If I shade it in the hole, I would now have a smooth curve. That would be a removable discontinuity. These next two discontinuities at negative at positive three and positive five are both non-removable because I have one vertical asymptote and I have one jump. So if a function is continuous, what does this mean for us? Um, a lot of times in calculus we're, we're, we're set with stuff and we're really going to look at a lot of continuous functions in calculus. But if a function is continuous, then the limits of a function can be found by direct substitution meaning that all I have to do is substitute this 3 in for x as long as it's continuous at that x value notice here we've got a we've got a parabola this is continuous for all values of x so if I just plugged in 3 I'd have 3 times 9 plus 2 which would give me a value of 29 okay so that that's just as simple as that here, um, my discontinuity here would be at x equals negative 1, so 1 here works fine. So I'm going to go and plug in 1, and I'm going to end up with a value of 2 thirds. Cosine of 2x, cosine of 2x is a continuous function for all values of x. So I'll just plug in pi over 3, and I'll have cosine of 2 pi over 3, and that's fine. Or if I wanted to uh, get negative 1 half, okay? All right, so notice here I didn't simplify as long as my as long as I plug in something and my value is a f actual value, it's okay to leave it at, at that. So um, sometimes for piecewise functions though we got a little bit different. We want to have to do a one-sided limit because I have a possible break in the graph here. So if I'm finding the limit as x approaches one, I have to go from the left and the right. So I'm going to do the limit as the as it approaches from the left. So as I approach from the left, I'm, I'm asking for values that are smaller than negative 1. But approaching, I'm sorry, positive 1, but approaching positive 1. So I'm looking at this function here, all right, this part of the function. So I'm going to plug 1 in here. So the limit as x approaches 1 from the left, I'm using this part of the graph. So I'm going to plug in 1. I'm going to get 4 minus 1, which is 3. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right, I'm going to use that one there. So I'm going to plug 1 in there. I'm going to get 4 minus 1 squared, which is also 3. Since these two limits are equal, my entire limit is also 3. So both 
one-sided limits must be equal for my limit for the whole thing to be three. Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna get the same thing in this one if I try this one. So let's go from the limit from the left first. The limit from the left, I'm just gonna write my numbers in here. Um, three minus one, which is two. This is my limit from the left. From the left. My limit from the right is gonna be two minus one, which is one. So notice here my limit from the left and my limit from the right are not equal. So since they're not equal, I'm gonna say this limit does not exist. Now, if I'm taking the limit as x approaches negative one for g of x, well, that's only less than one. I'm not going anywhere else. So all I have to do is plug in. I know that it's continuous here because this is a polynomial. So all I have to do is plug in direct substitution for that, and I'll get negative three plus one, which is negative two. All right, so I'm only using that area there. Another function that's a, like a piecewise function is called the greatest integer function. That also requires one-sided limit analysis because notice here I have the graph of, of this greatest integer function. It, um, it's like a step function, so you'll notice that it breaks apart. Um, what this means is that it's the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So let's say we have the limit as x approaches one half of the greatest integer function. So as I approach one half, here's one half. As I approach one half, we can easily see that the value is going to be zero. But if I just did direct substitution, what is the greatest integer of one half? Well, the greatest integer less than one half or equal to that is zero, right? So what about at x equals one? Well, at x equals one, if I approach from the left, I'm going to end up with zero. If I approach from the right, I'm going to end up with one. Since these two limits are not the same, this limit does not exist. Well, what about something a little bit harder, 2x minus 3? Well, what I would recommend is um, notice that we're coming from the left. So we're finding values that are smaller than 5, but really, really close to 5. So what I'm going to do is just some numerical analysis. I'm going to plug in 4.9, because this is pretty close. So I'm going to plug in 4.9 to x, and I'm going to see what I get. So I'm going to get, um, that's going to be 9.8 minus 3, which is going to give me 6. Um, 6.8. So if I was on this function, I would have a y value, oh, well, if I plugged it in, I want a y value of the greatest integer of 6.8. What's the greatest integer of 6.8? It's the integer that's less than or equal to that, which is 6. Okay, so that is my value. All right, so this is um, a little bit about continuity. Thanks a lot. See you later.